Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, today, we will be hearing four talks on math anxiety, examining child outcomes and contextual factors in early and middle childhood. Um, and first, we will be hearing uh, from Alyssa Gear, who is a postdoc at Purdue. Um, so Alyssa, you already have your screen shared. I'm going to let you take it away. All right, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump right in for the sake of time. Today I'll be talking about my dissertation project that I completed at Florida State University, which was on the relations between spatial and math skills in elementary school children with a particular interest in the role of domain specific anxieties. So since I'm going first, I actually wanted to just kind of first orient you to like what math anxiety is and how it's related to math. So math anxiety in general is apprehension when faced with math related tasks or experiences. Um, you might remember experiencing math anxiety or even test anxiety in kind of a math setting um, at all, for, all phases of life. I know the SAT for me was one of those phases. Uh, so research has consistently demonstrated a link between math anxiety and math performance. And I was actually on a meta-analysis that examined this relation. And the overall average effect size over like over two decades of research was a negative 0.28. So we, it is a pretty strong co correlation there. And this is suggesting that higher levels of math anxiety are associated with lower levels of math performance. So with this in mind, there are some gaps in the existing research on math and math anxiety. Um, one of these being that less work here has focused on children. A lot of this work is done with college aged adults or just adults in general. And less of this work considers the impact of other factors, which is kind of the whole focus of this symposium. Um, but for myself, this is looking at more cross domain relations with things like spatial cognition. So with that, I wanna orient you now to spatial skills, um, especially with this being a math conference, some of you might not be familiar. So spatial skills, and I'm gonna talk about them more broadly here, is this diverse group of skills talking about things like distance and direction and orientation, and you use spatial skills in your everyday life, whether it's driving to and from work, parallel parking when you get there, navigating to a place you've never been for, whether you use a map or a GPS, using your navigation skills in a maze, whether it be an online one or a corn maze, or even doing things like playing with blocks or using puzzles. So with that, spatial skills have been consistently linked in research to math skills. And with this, spatial skills have also been shown to be malleable or trainable and have been considered as targets for improving math skills in an intervention se section of research. And when you look at this causal spatial math link, most of the existing work examines how early spatial skills are predicting later math skills and interventions tend to follow this same causal direction, looking at the impact of training a spatial skill and how that might impact the math skills later on. More recently work has considered the possibility for bidirectional relations, but the results here are mixed with some finding evidence for this and some not. One of our studies with elementary students, as well as a study by Lombardi et al. in middle school, found some support for reciprocal relations with early math predicting later spatial skills, as well as early spatial skills predicting later math skills. But a study from the Verdeen lab with preschool age students did not find support for reciprocal relations. Thus, more work is needed to elucidate these relations and figure out what other factors might impact the relation here such as domain specific anxiety. So as I already mentioned, we have seen a relation between math anxiety and math skills, but research tends to link cognitive skills with their relative cognitive anxiety. And I actually conducted a spatial anxiety and spatial skills meta relatively recently, it's in preparation. And we found an overall average effect size of negative 0.15, suggesting that similar to math and math anxiety, we're seeing that higher levels of spatial anxiety are significantly related to lower levels of spatial skill. With both of these fields, less work, as I mentioned, has focused on any potential cross-domain relations, looking at is math anxiety also related to any of the spatial measures and is spatial anxiety related to any of the math measures. And a lot of this work, even in spatial cognition, focuses again on adults with less work considering if these anxieties are truly domain-specific in young kids. 
So for this project, I had two main research questions. The first is focusing again on this causal relation between math and spatial skills and what is the specific nature of this relation over two waves of data collection and do the relations between math and spatial anxiety at wave one and math and spatial skills at wave two exhibit domain specificity or are there these cross domain relations? For our methods, we uh, use data from the research on experiences, attitudes and learning in math or realm project. This was a longitudinal study funded by IES and this was data collection was completed in fall of 2018 and spring of 2019. We had six, about 600 first grade students. Our sample was split roughly half of identifying as female and nearly half qualified for free or reduced price lunch. We also had a fairly racially and ethnically diverse sample. For our measures, we gave a spatial skills task at waves one and two. This was the Thurstone's primary mental abilities tests mental rotation subtask. And this is basically you have to look at the target item on the left and pick which of the four items from the right can combine with the target to create a complete square. I've circled the correct answers on this uh, for your amusement and interest. Um, also, this task had 16 items, but we did include a planned missing design. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into how that worked, but if you have questions about it, I'm happy to explain. We also gave a math skills measure, which was the Elementary Mathematics Student Assessment, or the EMSA, and this had 22 items, and there was no planned missing design here. For our anxiety measures, we gave the spatial anxiety question, uh, modified version of the spatial anxiety questionnaire for children. Um, and this was 12 items with a planned missing design. These items were structured as a question, some of which had an image associated, and then children answered on a Likert scale of smiley faces, or in some cases, anxious faces. For the math anxiety task given at wave one, we gave an adapted version of the math anxiety scale for young children, and this had 14 items and no planned missing design. For the sake of the model that we included here, we have three covariates, which was gender, socioeconomic status, and reading. Um, so for gender, this is just whether they identified as male or female. Socioeconomic status was actually a composite score and a higher score indicates a higher level of socioeconomic status. And the reading task was the test of silent reading efficiency and comprehension. And this was a timed three minute task. For data collection at both waves, there were three separate testing sessions. So the first was for the math achievement assessment. The second was for all of the surveys and the mental rotation task. And the last was a three minute reading assessment. Teachers gave these tasks in their classrooms in group settings using the materials provided by researchers. And the test items and instructions were read aloud by teachers with the exception of the reading task for which only the instructions were read out loud. For our results, I actually initially ran four models for my dissertation, but for the sake of time, I've trimmed it down to one. And I'm going to talk about each component as I go through the model. So first, I want to talk briefly about the covariates. Um, gender was significantly positively associated with math anxiety, indicating that girls tended to have higher levels of math anxiety in this sample. Um, gender was also a significant negative predictor for spatial skills at wave two, suggesting that boys tended to outperform girls on spatial skills, which is in line with existing research. We also found that socioeconomic status was significantly positively associated with math skills at wave one, which is in line with existing research, uh, suggesting that higher socioeconomic status is associated with better academic achievement. For our first research question, we were talking about specifically that link between math and spatial skills. We did find autoregressive paths, meaning that early math predicted later math and early spatial predicted later spatial, which is to be expected when you give the same measure. We also found that these two measures were related within time points. So at wave one, they were correlated and their residuals at wave two were also correlated. But getting down to our research question, we did find evidence for reciprocal relations here with early math skills significantly predicting later spatial skills and early spatial skills significantly predicting later math skills. For our anxieties, we did find that math and spatial anxiety were significantly correlated. This was expected as they are both measuring a type of anxiety, but that correlation was importantly not too strong where they might be measuring the same thing. 
For math anxiety specifically, at wave one, it was significantly negatively correlated with both math and spatial skills. But when you shift to looking at the predictive nature, math anxiety was only a significant negative predictor for math skills. Spatial anxiety was not significantly related or predictive of either math or spatial skills at waves one or two. And lastly, for reading, we did find two significant correlations at wave one, the first being with math skills. Um, this was a positive relation indicating that higher levels of reading skills were associated with higher levels of math skills. Our math measure did incorporate several word problems, so it's possible that that's part of the reason, but this is in line with existing research showing that these skills do kind of overlap in some areas. And for math anxiety, we found that reading skills was significantly negative associated, negatively associated with math anxiety, and I don't really have a particular reason why other than maybe, again, that reading component of the items. So to assess if math anxiety was and spatial anxiety were truly exhibiting domain specificity, we conducted two walled tests. And this basically compares the math anxiety predicting math skills path to the math anxiety predicting spatial skills path. And for this one with math anxiety, the test was significant, suggesting that the predictive path between math and math anxiety was significantly stronger um, than the math anxiety predicting spatial skills. Um, mm -hmm path. For um, the wall test for spatial anxiety, as you might expect, this test was not significant, suggesting that there was no um, significant difference between the magnitudes of these paths here. Um, so for our first research question, looking specifically at the causal link between spatial and math skills uh, in line with our hypotheses and some of the existing research, the results here did suggest the presence of reciprocal relations between math and spatial skills, which does align again with some of this research on this relation. For our second question, looking at math and spatial anxieties and skills, um, we did find domain specific relations for math anxiety only, which is in line with existing research at this age. Importantly, spatial anxiety was not significantly related to either spatial or math skills at either time point. Um, and this is possibly due to the specificity of this spatial anxiety scale versus the math anxiety scale. Kids know what math is, so you can kind of just say like, how do you feel when you're doing math? Whereas the spatial anxiety task was extremely specific. And since there are different subtypes of spatial skill, it's possible that this particular spatial anxiety scale is more related to a different subtype of spatial skill. So there's a couple of reasons why we might not have seen this relation. For limitations and future directions, um, overall research results here suggest that math anxiety and spatial skills might be more useful than spatial anxiety as targets for interventions focused on improving math skills at this age. And future work should aim to expand upon this research because we did not include a domain general measure, so we can't make any um, kind of domain specific versus domain general comparisons here. We could only look at domain specific versus cross domain. Additionally, including different spatial tasks and subtypes is always a good thing to do in research. Mental rotation tends to be a large focus of the research and a different age group might be interesting. Uh, we did only include first graders, so going into second grade. So it would be extremely interesting to expand this work to look at other ages. So with that, I wanna say thank you, um, especially to um, my advisor, Colleen Ganley, uh, the Math Thinking and Learning Lab, and the uh, participant in the study, participants in the study, uh, as well as IES for funding this second, or funding this project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alyssa. Um, if you, we could maybe take one question while maybe Mary gets uh, set up. And I think you guys wanted to do more, leave more time for questions at the end too, right? Yeah, I think we were planning to kind of do a question maybe while somebody else sets up and then more questions at the end was a good plan.
All right, Mary, I see you're all set up. So if anyone has questions for Alyssa at the end, we're gonna have um, some time left over. Um, next up is uh, Mary De Pascale, uh, who's a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. And go ahead, Mary. So um, today I'll be presenting um, work with Luke Butler and Geetha Romani on the relation of math anxiety and play behaviors in four to six year old children. And math knowledge in early childhood is predictive of academic and math achievement through adolescence. However, from a young age, children's math achievement is influenced by a number of factors. And one factor that can influence children's math performance is their math anxiety, which is an anxiety specific to math performance, problem solving, and using math in everyday life. And findings indicate that math anxiety negatively relates to academic performance for children and adults. And for elementary school students in particular, higher math anxiety relates to lower performance on measures of arithmetic and math achievement. And fewer studies have examined math anxiety in preschool children, but findings indicate that even at the preschool age, there is variability in math anxiety. Um, however, the majority of studies focus on elements of children's formal math performance, but math in early childhood is not limited to formal math instruction. And early math often involves informal elements such as play, games, and exploration of other materials. In fact, children naturally explore early math topics in their free play activities, and learning math through play provides contextual practice of early math concepts in a way that can be engaging and motivating. And prior work indicates that there's variability in children's math-related play and exploration, including the amount of time they play and the enjoyment of their play and the mathematical content of their verbal and nonverbal play, and that these relate to their math learning. And studies also show that children vary in their choice to engage in math-related play, which suggests that children differ in their engagement and persistence um, in math activities. And because math anxiety is known to relate to math avoidance, it's possible that math anxiety could influence children's choice of activities or choice to persist in a math activity that they've already chosen. So the goal of the current study was to examine relations of math anxiety and play behaviors for young children. And we were specifically interested in relations of math anxiety with children's persistence and exploration in math related toy play, their reasoning about the toy, and any gender and age differences. The participants were 106 children ages four to six years old and they completed one 10 minute session in a preschool or children's museum setting, which included a math anxiety measure, a toy play task, and accounting and cardinality task. To measure math anxiety, we use Schaefer and colleagues math anxiety measure, which has seven items such as how do you feel when you have to count to 30, and children respond to them on a three point smiley face scale, which includes not nervous at all, a little nervous and very nervous. For the toy play task, children were introduced to a toy, which was a foam box with a blue button on the top of it and corresponding cards. And they were told that the toy would make a sound when someone counted the dots on the card and pressed the button the same number of times. And the task included three trials. So an example trial where the experimenter demonstrated counting two dots and pressing the button two times and confirmed that the child could hear the sound a practice trial with feedback where the experimenter prompted the child to count the three dots and press the button three times to hear the sound. And an exploration trial where the experimenter said they had to go write something down and gave the child a new card to play with. And children were given 90 seconds to play on their own during which the toy did not make the sound for any of their responses. So to examine children's persistence and exploration during this time, we coded their counting attempts, which was the number of times they counted the dots on the card, their button pressing attempts, which was the number of sets of times they pressed the button on the toy, and their time spent exploring the toy numerically, which could include their counting, their time pressing the button, um, and any talk about math. And at the end of the 90 seconds, we also asked children why they thought the toy didn't work. And we coded these explanations as being internal, like because I counted too many, 
external, like because it's broken or other when they said they didn't know. And as a later analysis, we also examined children's talk during their exploration beyond their counting and button attempts, since we observed more talk than we had anticipated. And we coded talk into four categories. So these were math knowledge or procedure statements, like um, that was eight. So anything related to math quantity or math related task procedures, math questions or uncertainty statements, which were questions about math or statements expressing uncertainty, like, can you help me count this card? Non-math statements, which were any statements that were not related to math, like it's not working and attention getting statements, which are any statements they made to get the attention of the experimenter or another adult in the room, such as, excuse me. And we did not code children's counting out loud since that was already accounted for in our measures of children's counting attempts and button pressing attempts. So um, now I'll show an example of a child exploring the toy um, and the transcript on the side will label their counting attempts and button attempts and their math knowledge statements are highlighted in purple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I said eight. I counted to eight, but it's not working. I counted to eight on this card, and it's not working. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's not even working. I'm pressing it eight times, but it's not working. I pressed it eight times, but it's not making the sound. Excuse me, I'm press I pressed it eight times, but it's not making the sound. Excuse me. Excuse me. All right, so you can see that this child used multiple counting attempts and button attempts, um, and their talk included math knowledge statements as well as attention getting statements and non math statements. Um, and overall, they spent about half of the time, so about 45 out of 90 seconds, exploring the toy in a numerical way. So um, for results, um, overall, we saw um, variability in children's math anxiety scores with their scores ranging from 1 to 2.71, um, with the scale going from 1 to 3, with higher values indicating higher math anxiety. And we also saw wide variability in children's play behaviors, including both their actions and talk. So this graph shows um, the type of behaviors on the y-axis and the average number of them on the x-axis. And then for children's explanations of why the toy didn't work, um, it was pretty evenly split. So there were about 30% internal explanations. So saying like, because I counted too many, 33% um, external. So saying like, because it's broken or, and 37% other when they said, I don't know. And contrary to what we predicted, math anxiety did not relate to children's counting attempts, button attempts, or the time spent exploring the toy numerically. However, math anxiety was a significant predictor of children's use of math knowledge statements during their play, such that higher math anxiety was related to using fewer math knowledge statements. And for children's explanations, we had predicted that children with higher math anxiety would be more likely to use an internal explanation, but this was not the case. However, when we examined subscores of math anxiety for items specifically focused on counting, we found that children's math anxiety scores on these items related to their explanation type. And we also examined gender and age differences. So first for math anxiety, um, this graph shows math anxiety on the y-axis and age on the x-axis um, by gender. 
And overall, girls had significantly higher math anxiety than boys. However, when we examined this by age, we found that there were no significant differences in math anxiety by gender for four or five-year-olds, but that there was a significant difference for six-year-olds. And for children's explanation types, this graph um, shows math anxiety on the y-axis and explanation type on the x-axis by gender. And we found that math anxiety predicted explanation type for boys, but not for girls. And there were no um, differences in the relation of math anxiety and any play behaviors by age or gender. So overall, we were interested in examining relations of math anxiety with children's play behaviors because previous research has indicated that children's engagement in math-related play and exploration relates to their math learning and achievement, and that children vary in the amount and type of play and exploration they engage in at school. And we observed wide variability in children's play behaviors, finding that children's talk, but not their actions related to their math anxiety, which suggests that math anxiety might influence children's engagement in certain aspects of their play. We also replicated previous findings of gender differences in math anxiety, and additionally found age differences in these differences because, and because few studies um, have examined math anxiety in preschool age groups, more work might be needed to further examine gender differences in math anxiety at these younger ages. And future directions include examining relations of math anxiety um, and choice of math and non-math related toys and activities. And this could provide further evidence about links between math anxiety and math avoidance in early childhood and have implications for children's early math learning and development. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank members of our lab as well as the children who participated in this research. I have a quick question. You might've mentioned this um, at the beginning, but uh, do you remember the reliability of that scale for the four to six year olds? Like how the item, because you were saying the math anxiety scale was not a significant predictor. I'm just curious how those items link together. Um, I am not actually not sure. sure. Okay, yeah, you can let me know later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, next, we uh, have uh, Jimena Coso. Um, who unfortunately had a last minute time conflict, um, but was able to pre-record her talk uh, for us to hear today. And I believe, Mary, you're going to play that for us now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being there and I am so sorry that I have to record this presentation. So the call of today is called Conceptualizing the Factor Structure of Parent Mad Anxiety and Association with Children's Mathematical Skills. Just a little bit about the background, we already know that parents play an essential role in promoting children's opportunities to develop cognitive abilities such as mathematical skills. We also know that there is an existing gap in children's mathematical performance as early as pre-K and children's mathematical learning experience with parents at home may differ as well. One important factor uh, associated with parents' mathematical support is the level of math anxiety. Previous research has looked at uh, parents' math anxiety and suggested that this is important um, in supporting children's mathematical development. However, most of this research has looked at parents' math anxiety uh, as a or a unidimensional um, construct and has not considered the context of the different type of anxiety and its association and its association to children's mathematical performance. There are some research looking at this uh, contextual nature of mal anxiety for teachers. For example, there is a recent measure of teacher mal anxiety that include a component of general mal anxiety and teaching specific man anxiety. The teaching specific man anxiety component relate, uh, refers to the anxiety that teacher feels when uh, teaching mathematics to their students in the classroom. 
However, um, we don't know about this uh, contextual nature of mad anxiety when uh, looking at parents' mad anxiety and its association, uh, association to children's early mathematical skills. So we don't know uh, if there is a particular type of parents' mad anxiety that drives the um, this association, such as general parents' mad anxiety or anxiety that parents can feel when interacting with their children. Most of the work that look at mad anxiety has used questionnaire developed for a college students and have been adapted for other populations. And the most common scales are the mathematical anxiety rating scale, the mad anxiety rating scale revised, and the shortened uh, mad anxiety rating scales. There are also some research that look mad anxiety through a single item questionnaire using the single item measure of mad anxiety. So, um, and most of the research that found uh, an association between parents' mad anxiety and children's early math mathematical skills, uh, which um, a direct or indirect association, differs uh, based on the measure that they use to assess parents' mad anxiety. There is not yet an agreement on how to conceptualize the measure of parents' mad anxiety. So we thought that parents' mad anxiety relate to children's mad performance may be context dependent. Parents could feel anxious when engaging themselves in mathematics activities, but also they can feel anxious when uh, interacting with their, with their children in mathematics, which are two different contexts. So it is unclear how and whether different aspects of parents' mad anxiety are uh, differentiated, uh, differentiated associated with children's early numeracy skills. So for the current study, we were interested in empirically determining the best conceptual, uh, conceptualization of parental mad anxiety and to examine how the underlying structure of parental mad anxiety best relate to children's numeracy uh, achievement. So for this study, we have uh, 155 children and the uh, average age was four years and two months at the start of preschool. The sample was racially and ethnically diverse, and most of the parents answered the, the survey. Children's numeracy skill was assessed using the PENS uh, brief version, and we used 14 questions in a survey for parents to assess parents' mad anxiety. Of those 14 questions, six items were adapted from the mad anxiety scale for teachers and the Gulick mad anxiety scales to uh, create the construct of parents' anxiety when engaging the, by themselves in mathematics. And eight items were used to uh, generate the construct of parents' mad anxiety when engaging with their children in mathematics. We also have um, some control variables in all our analysis. So this table is just um, uh, with the items that we use for the factor anxiety when engaging uh, themselves in mathematics, such as calculating tip without a calculator. And here are the items that we use for the factor anxiety when engaging with the child in mathematics, such, such as playing math-related games. So we run a um, two-factor uh, confirmatory factor analysis in M+. We first you, uh, you run a single factor CFA, including all the items of parents mal anxiety, and then we run a two factor um, CFA, the first um, factor representing parents mal anxiety when engaging themselves in mathematics, and the second factor representing parents mal anxiety when engaging with their child in mathematics. And we use the just and the common statistics to, to test model fit. So here um, are the results of the first two models. The overall fit indices, just such, such as um, CFI, TI, indicate that neither of the models has an excellent fit to the data. Although neither of the models demonstrate an excellent fit, we selected the two-factor model as an adequate model, given that a significant chi-square um, and the lower AIC and BIC value, as also seen in other um, papers such as uh, 
hard at all. So however, um, the latent factors of the two-factor model were highly correlated, correlation of 0.8. To address the concern, we examined the correlation between the two factors, um, parents engaging themselves in mathematics and parents engaging with their child in mathematics as two separate components, uh, composite score, and we continue to find a high um, correlation, 0.76. So this correlation suggested that the two factors um, model will be uh, were, were very similar. So therefore, we decided to test if a B-factor model would be more uh, appropriate when exploring parents' mad anxiety, uh, the factor through the structure of parents' mad anxiety, so, uh, because a B-factor model allows for an unidimensional and multidimensional latent structure. So this model um, like then low to a general mad anxiety factor and a subset of item load loaded into one of the hypothesized um, factors, the engaging by themselves and engaging with the child in mathematics. The results indicate that the B-factor model had a better fit to the data than the two-factor model and that most of the factor loading were um, adequate, greater than um, 0.20. This is just the figure with the loading factor, but because of the time, I will just move forward. Um, so the results, after uh, having a good fit to the data in a B-factor model, the next step is to look at the ancillary B-factor measure uh, uh, to look at the dimensionality. And all the, um, the statistics uh, suggest that uh, parents mad anxiety uh, is best described as a multidimensional model. And then we run a structural equation modeling just to show the, the figure of the sum. Um, the model, the model uh, fit statistics were good. However, neither the general mal anxiety factor need, uh, nor the specific factor anxiety when engaging themselves in mathematics and anxiety when engaging with their child in mathematics significantly predicted children's numeracy skills. As um, a brief discussion, this finding suggests a parent's experience when engaging themselves in mathematics in their everyday life and anxiety when engaging with their child in mathematics are two different uh, correlated uh, dimensions beyond the general mad anxiety. Uh, the context dependent of mad anxiety items such as those related to situations where the parents engage in, with their child in mathematics and those related to situations where the parents have to engage by themselves um, in, in mathematics are, uh, considered to, are, are considered to be important factors when exploring parents' uh, mad anxiety. A possible explanation for the lack of association that between parents' mad anxiety and children's numeracy skills could be uh, because of the cross-sectional data that we use. So we recommend that future studies can look at this uh, multidimensionality model of parents' mad anxiety using uh, longitudinal data to see the children's grow instead of concurrent data. And maybe another explanation is that uh, parents play a, a, an important role in predicting children's mathematical skills when interacting with other factors. So maybe future studies could use this structure of a multidimensional model um, to explore an indirect effect of parents' mal anxiety. So thank you so much, uh, and I hope to, I will try to be at the end of the presentation to answer some questions, but if not, uh, please feel free to email me with some questions and keep talking about this topic. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I'm so glad we were still able to hear that talk. Um, as she said, I think she's going to still try to join um, at the end for any questions, but uh, feel free to reach out directly to her with any questions if she doesn't make it onto the Zoom. Um, okay, our final talk for today um, is from Caroline Bird Hornberg. And 
and okay, good, your screen sharing is working. All right. I'll mute myself first, right? All right. <clears throat> Thanks. So um, kind of digging into a bit of an older population than um, the other presenters have talked about, um, but this is going to dig into both parents and children's math anxiety um, and their attitudes and parents' ratings of children's um, <clears throat> math anxiety and attitudes as well. Um, so just to really touch briefly on the background, because I know we've hit on it in some other presentations as well, but we know from past work that parents' math anxiety and attitudes are related to children's math attitudes and their achievement, um, but we don't know as much about um, kind of what parents think about their own children's math anxiety, kind of are parents going to rate children's math anxiety um, the same way that children rate their own math anxiety and attitudes. Um, and then similar to um, Jimena's talk, it's kind of thinking about how parent math anxiety has really been mostly measured in terms of how parents feel about math themselves rather than parents' anxiety surrounding teaching their children math or helping their child with math. Um, so, and briefly, um, we know that this is important. Um, math knowledge, if we think about math performance in this um, early uh, elementary school, this is predictive of later academic success and high school graduation. Um, my study is gonna focus on second, third, and fourth graders. Um, and we have some data um, from NAEP, and this you know, has even been updated more recently that most fourth graders are not meeting those minimum national proficiency standards. Um, so it's important to think about what factors contribute to children's math performance. I'm just going to jump right into the method here. Um, it's a fairly small sample. Um, this was collected uh, during COVID. So I had 59 second, third, and fourth graders and their parents. Um, mean age was about nine years. Um, a little bit more girls than boys, but the grade levels were pretty evenly split. Um, I will say in terms, I saw a note in the chat about demographics. Um, so this was a primarily white sample, not um, super diverse, um, only 20% for your reduced lunch. Uh, and for parents, that was mostly mothers that filled out this survey. Um, and uh, we had a quite educated population here. So um, the majority of parents did uh, report having either a master's or a PhD. Um, and then 15% with less than a bachelor's degree and 19% um, that had a bachelor's degree. So that's just something to keep in mind about um, the unique uh, population here. I was kind of recruiting uh, from you know, some university parents and that kind of um, more convenient sample. Uh, so what was the method? Uh, we had a Zoom interview with children and uh, had some survey items of their math anxiety and math attitudes. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we also gave them some word problems to solve. Um, and so this is from uh, Sarah Powell's recent work and you know, just some problems displayed on the screen and children um, could kind of work on their own and work those out and there were eight problems for them to solve, um, just simple word problems. And then for parents, it was an online survey. They reported on children's math anxiety and children's math attitudes. And I see there's a lot of action in the chat, but there's someone stop me if it is meant for me, <laughs> um, or you can unmute. And then we also asked about parents' own math anxiety, both in general and their sort of attitudes about teaching their children about math. Um, briefly about the survey measures, these faces will seem familiar, um, so I had reached out to Colleen Ganley as I was thinking about this project um, and, you know, was looking at the, the measures that um, <clears throat> Alyssa mentioned in her uh, project about the realm study, um, but I actually, I used similar faces, but um, was focused on the nine item um, M. Amos uh, measure math anxiety. Um, this project was in conjunction with a, another uh, research project where I had undergraduates also filling out um, a math anxiety questionnaire, and I wanted to map those items to the adult 
um, version. But in this paper by Carey et al, it's been, uh, it was used in a British sample um, of eight to 13 year olds. So it was kind of ready to be used for this age group. And I just adapted it to say math instead of maths. Um, we also uh, assess child math attitudes adapted from Frederick and Eccles. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the competence interest value just for the sake of time today, but, um, but we did have those types of items. And then uh, in collaboration with um, Colleen as well, um, you know, her, her team developed some math avoidance items and they're still working at, um, on some, you know, other, other work uh, investigating uh, math avoidance, um, but I had emailed a bit about uh, creating some of those items as well. So we had eight items there. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to talk more about kind of what their team is um, seeing about that as well. But that was a uh, presented on slides, no, not really kind of, or yes, where children could rate. In terms of the parent survey, um, we only had one item here for parent math anxiety, just doing mathematics makes me anxious, um, similar to the, um, Jimena mentioned that, some uh, single item kind of rating scale of capturing that. Um, we also had one item of the parent report of child math anxiety, just doing mathematics makes my child anxious. Um, and then we also had parents report on child's math attitudes, the competence, um, interest and value. And then uh, I created some additional math teaching attitudes um, kind of measure adapted from Boyd at all 2014, which was more of a teacher in math anxiety um, paper. And, and it was three items. Um, I am competent teaching my child mathematics. I'm comfortable teaching my child mathematics. And I know how to encourage my child to overcome difficulties in mathematics. Um, so we can come back to that um, at the end too, but that was something new. So uh, a little bit about the scales. Um, the alpha for the scales um, was pretty good. So even um, for this uh, avoidance, uh, close to 0.8, uh, I wanted to kind of just look and, and talk about comparisons of child ratings of their own math anxiety compared to the parent ratings of child's anxiety. Um, so we're thinking one to five for children's ratings, it was thinking about how nervous would you be in certain situations. So one being not nervous at all and five being very, very nervous. Um, so their uh, average is close to about two. Um, but in terms of parent ratings on the five point scale, uh, that was doing mathematics makes my child anxious on a scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, and so they were uh, a bit higher on that scale than the children were. Um, and avoidance was on a no, not really kind of or yes scale. So it's out of four instead of five. Um, but if you kind of divide, you know, divide these by five and by four, it's, it's fairly similar. Kids were um, a little bit closer to the midpoint in terms of avoidance if you kind of do that calculation. Also in terms of parents' ratings of their own math anxiety, um, that average uh, was a little bit lower than their ratings of children's math anxiety. Um, the math teaching attitudes that I talked about, about being comfortable teaching your child mathematics, competent teaching your child mathematics, and um, able to uh, help your children with difficult mathematics, that uh, scale actually performed quite, uh, quite well with those items hanging together. Um, and, you know, this was, I'm noting here, it's, those were framed in a positive way um, rather than in that kind of the anxiety way where a higher number is indicating more anxiety. Um, so just getting right to some correlations here. Uh, lots of numbers. I'm going to focus in first on just the anxiety measures. Um, so in terms of parents' own math anxiety, that actually wasn't correlated with uh, in this sample of you know, small, um, again, quite skewed uh, in terms of um, parent SES, but uh, children's math anxiety and parents' math anxiety were not correlated. Um, but the parent report of children's math anxiety was correlated both with parents' own math anxiety and with children's reported math anxiety. Um, I also want to just look at this math avoidance measure. Um, so children's math avoidance was highly correlated with their own reported math anxiety. Um, it was also uh, 
highly correlated or moderately correlated with um, parents' report of children's math anxiety. And then I'm gonna look down here um, at the children's own performance. This is accuracy on those word problems. Um, generally, it was correlated with most of these attitude and uh, anxiety measures, um, but not with uh, children's self-reported math value. That, that scale actually had a lower, a slightly lower reliability as well, only about um, 0.6, I think, and the others were more um, close to 0.8. So at least in this age range, it's maybe children aren't um, you know, is consistent in their uh, representations of their own math va math uh, value. And children's math performance also, you know, there wasn't a significant correlation here with the parent math anxiety. You know, again, there's maybe this um, per, uh, specific sample, but um, certainly this avoidance of math um, and the children's self-reported math competence um, were highly correlated with their own math performance. And then this new parent uh, math teaching attitudes scale, um, the, uh, this was significantly correlated with children's own math performance. Um, so I'm, we're going to uh, be looking at some regression models and I can show you how that um, kind of plays out. So let's uh, look into that. So uh, predicting word problem solving performance as the dependent variable um, it controlled for grade and parent education. Um, it didn't control for gender in here because gender was not a significant, there weren't significant differences in boys and girls on the word problem solving measure. Um, and just with such a small sample, I didn't um, include that here. But I will say overall that um, the child reported math anxiety was higher for girls than it was for boys. Um, but if we put here child reported math anxiety in the model, that was a significant predictor of their word problem solving performance above grade and parent education. Um, <clears throat> instead, you know, just to kind of quickly, instead of showing a, a lot of models, um, if instead of putting child reported math anxiety in this model, I put the parent report of the child's math anxiety, that was actually a stronger predictor of the child's um, problem solving performance in this age group. And then if instead I, I replace this last point in the model with the child reported math avoidance, um, that was an even stronger predictor than if the child's um, own self-reported uh, math anxiety. And so and if anyone has questions about those items, we can um, touch on that as well. Um, so what about parent math teaching attitudes? That also is a significant predictor on its own uh, above and beyond grade and parent education. <clears throat> um, that's uh, partial correlation about 0.3 there. So what about thinking about parent math teaching attitudes in conjunction with a child outcome as well? Uh, putting that in the same model, uh, if I put in child reported math avoidance, that was the one that had the strongest, uh, uh, it explained the most variance, uh, unique variance in previous models. So I put, chose to put that one in here. Um, and both of these remained unique, um, significant predictors. Here avoidance, um, uh, looking at that, uh, that explained about 21% of unique variance um, in children's word problem solving performance um, and these, this parent teaching attitudes is about 7% unique variance. Um, just to wrap up, so we have some more time for questions, but it seemed to be that parents were um, you know, somewhat attuned to children's math anxiety and even that predictor of uh, parents' ratings of children's math anxiety was a, a bit more correlated with children's own performance than the children's perceptions of that. Um, and, and again, this is second to fourth graders. Um, and I did see children's math anxiety and their math avoidance, as well as the parents' attitudes in terms of supporting their children's math learning. Those were all significant predictors of children's math performance uh, with word problem solving. Um, but certainly this was a small sample and not um, super diverse. Um, so more research is needed here. Um, and it's also important to try and get longitudinal measures and just better capture the home learning environment there. Um, but want to thank uh, the students and parents who participated, um, especially Colleen Gantley and Sarah Powell, who I emailed with about um, the measures and students in my lab. And I can answer any questions.
So we have about five more minutes. So any questions for Caroline or uh, and then any of the speakers? I see um, Jimena was also able to join now as well. So um, and I've been seeing some discussion going on about math anxiety in the chat. So if anyone wants to bring that, that would be great as well. I'm reading the chat. There's a couple questions in there that were up at the top that I hadn't gotten around to yet. I can go ahead and read <laughs> one of Brecky's yeah. questions, which I think was for Alyssa. So what mm -hmm. type interventions might you suggest given the relationship between math anxiety, math skills, and spatial skills? Yeah, um, so there's actually already quite a bit of intervention work um, in, for math anxiety, at least the one that I'm familiar with has mostly been done in adult populations, not so much, I, I'm not familiar personally with children, uh, math anxiety interventions yet, but given my results, I think that maybe we should start kind of of thinking more about the younger ages. Um, I also saw kind of like a follow-up question from Brecky also that was kind of like, where is math anxiety coming from? Um, and that's kind of, I think like the million dollar question, like, is it coming from the people that are teaching them math? Is it coming from them just not fully understanding the math and therefore developing an anxiety that therefore is related or predicted, predicting their outcomes later on? Um, and the answer, the long answer is too long for this question answer <laughs> section here, but the short answer is that that's why we need to keep doing this work and we need to elucidate the factors that are related to math anxiety. Is it coming from their parents? Is it coming from their teachers? Is it coming from within themselves? And I think more work is, you know, and just in this group alone, we're already starting to kind of examine these things. Um, Colleen's work, the grant that I was fortunate enough to build my dissertation into is looking at teachers and how they're relating to children's math anxiety and math outcomes and their attitudes about math in general. So um, greatly looking forward to the results of kind of the bigger picture part of that project and not just my own work. Um, as far as interventions, uh, spatial skills, uh, actually the project that Bree and I are both on here at Purdue is a kind of spatial intervention that's hoping to impact math, math outcomes in preschoolers. So we're looking at intervening on block play. Um, and there's actually quite a few studies actually out there about intervening on block play and how that relates to math outcomes. So uh, Brecky, if you wanna email me, I'm happy to forward some of those along. Um, I'm much more familiar with the spatial skills aspect than the math anxiety intervention aspect, although I did uh, I was a co-author on a math anxiety intervention in college-aged individuals, so the long, it's a long answer. I could go on for hours, but I want to give time for other questions, especially since uh, Jimena didn't get to have uh, a Q&A after her, st her study was presented. I see a question for Caroline in the chat also on um, that relationship between performance and parent anxiety of what the direction of that effect might be. Yeah, Brecky, um, when you mentioned parent anxiety, are you are you thinking about that parent kind of math teaching attitude that I talked about with the <clears throat> or I feel comfortable teaching my child mathematics piece? Yes. Yes, yeah. that exactly right. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it could be um, both. I, you know, I, I think that they're, you know, perhaps being better supportive um, of of the children. Uh, I mean, I, I think it, there could be a bi-directional. I mean, it's hard to say with with just this one um, one time point here. Yeah, I was actually wondering if, based on other stuff you've done whether you had a sense of what the direction was, that's all. Because mm. that's also getting at sort of what are the root causes of anxiety? You know, if your parents worried about your math performance, and I was one of those parents, by the way, um, how much is that gonna really influence the child's anxiety about doing math? So there's so many factors. Uh, Alyssa's right, this is, this is the big question, really. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we talked about the, uh, I know Sarah Hart's paper, uh, or the one that she led as well. And, and we're thinking, uh, you know, there's this genetic piece as well. Uh, it's a lot of factors. Yeah, for sure. You know, it is uh, past in the top of the hour, so some people ha have to go. Um, and I just wanted to thank our uh, presenters today and everybody for coming and remind everybody that uh, there is a session of Lightning Talks next Thursday on the 21st at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think that was a rescheduled session. So just wanted to put out a reminder of that as well. But thank you everyone so much for a great session today. Did, did y'all want to debrief or I guess we're still recorded, so maybe not, <laughs> but great job, everyone. It was really great. Thank you to Mary for organizing. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Thank you, Mary. And thanks Sorry. also to Brie for hosting. <laughs> so fun. Yeah, everyone. Everybody was great. Thanks for the discussion and everything. <laughs> Bye. Bye.